in this next section, I want to talk about Rococo art or Rococo art. And I want to start actually by talking about a painter who is not Rococo. Uh, his name is Nicolas Poussin, and he's a French Baroque painter who learned how to paint in Italy. And the reason why I'm introducing you to his work first is he is sort of the hero of the French uh, style of painting. And he is known basically for being the painter who set the standard or um, set the, raised the bar for French painting, especially what it follows in the uh, 1700s. So Poussin does a painting that has a classical theme and it is really very much in the tradition of actually early Renaissance painters. What I'm kind of talking about here is this painting called Et in Arcadia Ego literally translates into I am here in Arcadia too. And the first thing that you need to know to analyze this painting is to discuss the idea that Arcadia and Arcadian scenes are scenes of the pasture, they're beautiful landscapes that have to do with nature, with a, a lifestyle that has to do with going out into the fields and, and living uh, in a more natural way. And this is a sort of concept that is taken up actually in the 1700s by various authors. One of them is Rousseau, who actually talks about Arcadian kinds of uh, existences. And when we studied Versailles, one of the things that uh, is important or kind of relevant to this is, in Versailles, they actually had sort of fake little peasant houses and cottages that, for instance, Marie Antoinette would go out with a silver or a gold bucket and uh, the animals would be perfumed and washed so that she could actually pretend that she was a peasant, sort of following a more pastoral existence. So the other word is uh, pastoral, which refers to pastures, literally, and shepherds working in the fields. So it was considered a kind of paradise to live that kind of existence. Now we know that that life would be very difficult and would be a really hard life to be a shepherd, but for people who lived in cities in the 18th century and in the 17th centuries, they might have romanticized it a little bit. So what Poussin is saying in this painting is that these shepherds who look very much as if they're in an Arcadian scene are standing before a sarcophagus and they are reading on the sarcophagus that death is in Arcadia also, that I am here in Arcadia too and at in Arcadia you go. Some other things in terms of the physical or formal characteristics of this painting that I think will be important for you to be aware of or take notice of are that we have a sort of frieze-like arrangement, meaning that it looks a little bit like, for instance, the Arapacus Auguste from ancient Rome. It also looks a little bit like the friezes that show the Panathenaic procession from the Parthenon. And what we see here is an arrangement where the pasture, the landscape behind it is a backdrop. And these figures are arranged almost like the bas reliefs on those classical sculptures. And they also have the idealized body and the kalos that we talked about, meaning that uh, beauty and goodness are wedded together, that we can actually see that the package, that the way people look, reflects how their inner beauty. Poussin also does this in other paintings. And what he is showing here, you here is the myth of Echo and Narcissus. And uh, you may have heard someone being called a, a narcissist in some ways, means someone who's self-absorbed or really not very interested in communicating with others and thinks that they are more important and more beautiful. Well, that comes from this myth. And the myth, in a nutshell, is this. Echo was a nymph who offended the goddesses uh, mainly by lying to them and by repeating everything the goddess would say. And in this instance, the story in particular, I think is Jove or Zeus was uh, participating in a little bit of a extramarital affair. And when Juno or Hera came to the, the nymph Echo and asked Echo, where's my husband? What is he doing? Echo would just repeat everything that the goddess would say, and therefore her curse was to do that forever, and that explains why we have echoes, for instance, when you shout across a, a uh, courtyard or a valley, you hear an echo. 
the rest of the story is about a beautiful young man named Narcissus who had never beheld himself but was always held in very high esteem by other people because he was so physically beautiful that people were attracted to him. And this story is talked about a little bit in Ovid's Metamorphosis and Echo and Narcissus. The story is written in poem form in that text by Ovid. Basically what happens is Echo is following Narcissus around because she's so in love with his beauty and Narcissus ends up going uh, to a pond and he leans in to take a drink of water and he falls in love with his own reflection. And because he's so self-absorbed, so involved with his own reflection, he's not really aware that it's his own reflection and he eventually dies. And when he's talking to himself to compound the issue and make it seem more lifelike to him, Echo is repeating everything he's saying. So he'll say, wow, you're really a beautiful person in that pond. And Echo will repeat everything that Narcissus is saying. So the long and short of it is we have this scene that depicts a sort of doomed love in a pastoral scene that's set up freeze-like where the figure of Narcissus in the foreground is extremely beautiful and Echo is sort of set up behind him almost in a way that looks like a freeze. It in some ways recalls Nicholas Pisano's, um, Nicola Pisano's uh, altarpiece on the baptistry, uh, the, the um, the little freeze that we studied a lot in depth before, but this, in this instance, it's meant to be a moralizing and sort of a memento mori. So the two paintings that we looked at by Poussin, which are Baroque French paintings, deal with classicism in a moralizing way and depict the classical themes in a way that sort of warn you against things that would be necessarily a sort of negative thing uh, and using, um, and not really participating in society and looking at classicism in a classy way. One could argue that this painting by Poussin is not that way, that it's not meant to be moralizing, but I think that you might actually sort of think about it in a way that it is. And what I'm suggesting is that this painting is also going to be a schema for some other things that we're going to look at later on in the Rococo, especially Watteau's painting. And uh, what I want to suggest to you is that this shows a Bacchanal. And if you get a chance, you should read by Euripides the, the Bacchic women or the, the Bacchi, which is a story about basically Dionysus who's coming back to his hometown and getting revenge on the people who have not uh, worshipped him adequately and also the fact that they have talked badly about his mother. And some of the scenes in it describe Bacchanals, which are basically the Maenids or followers of, of Dionysus, sort of dance and become enchanted by the spirit of Dionysus, who's the god of wine, the god of ecstasy, and the god of drama. And in the worship of Dionysus, you go into an ecstatic sort of thrall. And that's what's going on in this scene, and that's called a Bacchanal. And we have this sort of freeze-like arrangement of these dancing figures all dancing in front of a, a sculpture of Pan. Uh, and we have a sort of arrangement that almost feels musical, and it also looks like a frieze. This painting also kind of relates to a poem that I assign in my class called Ode on a Grecian Urn, which describes a scene that's very similar to this, and maybe we'll read it later and compare this painting to it. If you consider that Poussin is sort of the schema for later French painting, you can do some comparisons of the physical or formal style of Poussin's painting against painting that comes later, especially painting that's called a Rococo painting. And so what I'd like to do is talk about Rococo painting and how it evolves out of the French Baroque style that's evidenced here by this portrait of Louis XIV by Hyacinth Rigaud. So the portrait on the right-hand side represents King Louis. And we went over this when we were studying Versailles. And basically, in terms of the physical or formal qualities of this painting, you can see that it's painted in a very realistic way. It's very hard edged. It has some very uh, clear painting. You can't see any brush strokes. Louis is elevated on a platform. All of the icons of his power, his scepter, his crown, the fleur de lis on the gowns are all evidence of his wealth, his power as an aristocrat and as an absolute monarch, even the sword at his side. 
He's also standing in a pose that actually is taken. It's a ballet pose. And Louis actually did participate in his own ballets and performed for people at court. Kind of reminds me of the story of the Emperor Nero, who forced people to come and watch him fiddle or play harp. Louis was an absolute ruler and an absolute monarch and was very clear about what he was doing. And on the left-hand side, painted about 15 years after, is a painting by Antoine Watteau. I've heard it pronounced Watteau because Antoine Watteau was basically a, the son of an immigrant who was a Hungarian roof tiler who moved to France and worked there. And the painting by Watteau is called The Indifferent. And it basically represents an aristocrat from the Ro 